Good morning, everyone. Welcome back on this first day of October. We are so thrilled to have you all. Today is um, a session I've been really looking forward to. I have some of my heroes here with us today and thrilled to um, share them with you all. This session is going to be focused on therapeutics. And I think it's, it's worthwhile just bringing up um, the framing of therapeutics in this moment. You know, there's been a lot of focus on vaccines and vaccine development. And obviously this is a critical area, but therapeutics have also played a critical role. And there's been a lot of discussion and unfortunately also a lot of misinformation about therapeutics at this time. And so we have uh, three phenomenal speakers who are going to be joining us today. Before we um, kick off this event, we'd like to um, bring in our two poll questions. And so I'm going to ask um, Ivan to put them on the screen for you. They're in line with today's um, session. So you'll see there are two questions here. The first is, should COVID-19 patients have a right to try drugs that have not been studied and approved? By, I think that would say the, F, the um, FDA there. And then the second is, if you were hospitalized for COVID-19, would you agree to be in a randomized, double-blind placebo trial for a promising but unproven medication? So maybe take a minute to answer those questions and think about um, what you would say for those. So interesting. So the first question, we had an overwhelmingly positive response. 70% uh, say that patients should have a right to try drugs. And this will be something that I think we may touch on either directly or indirectly today. And we can certainly talk about this in the Q&A. I think the second one, um, there was a little bit more of a split. Still the majority of you um, said that you would agree to be in a, in a randomized double-blind placebo trial, which is obviously a critical um, piece of information. And, and we can think a little bit about this in the context of other therapeutics at other times that have come forward. Certainly, we've seen a lot more people being willing to be part of trials, both in the context of treatment and vaccines. Um, but, but still a significant number said they would not. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass the baton to Alan, who will um, pick up this and, and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, Today's session is so important, and I thought I would just briefly mention, as Ingrid did, vaccines and how to test them and ultimately whether or not they work has gotten a lot of attention. But the attention to issues of therapeutics, perhaps less so, except for in the instance of some controversies of proposed therapeutics where there wasn't much evidence of whether they were effective or whether they were safe. And when Ingrid and I were developing the course, we really had a decision to make. Where, were, where were, were we going to put therapeutics in relationship to vaccines? And it occurred to us that frontline physicians were seeing patients and deeply concerned about how best to treat them. And that while we all are hopeful that there will be safe and effective vaccines that have universal access, what we realized is at this minute in the epidemic, we really have to be thinking critically about how best to treat patients. Um, as everyone in the class knows, on Tuesday, we met two people who have had COVID-19. One was never hospitalized. One spent more than five weeks on a ventilator and survived and is doing great. But their problem of how will I be treated? I'm sick, what can I do? And the problem for health providers, what's the best thing to do? And what do we have to offer these patients today? And what might we have to offer people who become infected? This is one of the most basic questions of the pandemic. As a historian, I'm really interested in therapeutics because it's one of the longest debates about what works, what doesn't work, and how do we figure that out? And I have to say, as I was thinking about today's session, um, there have now been 400,000 patients hospitalized approximately in the United States um, since around February 1st. 
um, 20,000 of those patients ended up in intensive care units. About 2,500 patients have been on ventilators. And today there are 6,000 people on, in ICUs around the United States. So we've been thinking a lot about the question of what might really help these patients. And it's both clinical care, we heard from Dr. Bidinger on Tuesday, turning patients over on their stomachs turns out to be a fantastic clinical innovation that was achieved during this period and has saved lives. So there are the nonspecific management issues that physicians are facing in the hospitals, but there are also fundamental questions of what might really reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with the pandemic. And the three physician scientists today are really remarkable people. They're members of our Harvard faculty. They are people who have worked on issues of infectious disease and therapeutics and health policy throughout their careers. But like many people in our community, really beginning in January, but even before, they've turned their attention to trying to address this incredibly complicated and important problem of what might help people who are currently infected and suffering and facing the potentially deadly, um, deadly impact of the disease. So um, we have three really great people here today, people who I have so much admiration for. Our first speaker will be Dr. Raj Gandhi. And like many people in the infectious disease area, he's done extensive research on HIV therapeutics and treatments. He's directed major trials. And he now has turned his attention to what are some of those therapeutic strategies and how can they be effectively evaluated. Um, he, he's a leader in infectious diseases at the Mass General. Um, our second speaker will be Rochelle Walensky. Dr. Walensky actually heads the Division of Infectious Diseases at the MGH. And she's widely known for her innovative work on infectious disease modeling, therapeutic evaluation, and innovative strategies for how we will know um, what works and what doesn't work. I should also say, you've probably seen her you know, in the media. She's been one of the most effective spokespeople about the public aspects of the pandemic and its social and um, policy responses. And our third speaker will be Jonathan Abraham who's also a incredibly impressive physician scientist who's worked in microbiology and immunology as well as infectious diseases. He's been a leader in what's called the Mass Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, which was something set up through the Harvard medical system, but has broadly collaborated on strategies to develop in real time in this incredibly complex situation, effective therapeutics, especially associated with antibody um, treatments. So we really have such a great group today and I'll turn it over first to Dr. Gandhi.
All right, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I will be talking about uh, specifically uh, the role of um, antibodies in treating infections by emerging viruses with a focus on COVID-19, also some background on uh, MassCPR, which is an organization that uh, Dr. Gandhi and I are a part of, um, as well as multiple investigators throughout the Boston area. So this is really something that was formed early in March through the vision of um, the Dean of the Med School, George Daly, and the idea was to rapidly establish a consortium that would meet an urgent need for drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics to prevent uh, and treat infections by emerging pathogens. Um, ultimately, we had uh, COVID-19 as the major initial priority to tackle. And I should add that this was in early March before uh, you know, uh, various strategies to reduce spread, including uh, wearing masks and social distancing were not in place, but a few of us attending this meeting were nervous um, about what was coming. Um, but ultimately, this was perhaps the last big meeting, or the last meeting actually I was a part of um, since that time. And so uh, the therapeutics working group, so there are multiple uh, aspects. I mentioned diagnostics, vaccines, uh, vaccines, which for example is led by uh, Dr. Dan Baruch, um, um, as well as Dr. Andrew Carfee. Uh, Dan Baruch is at the Beth Israel Hospital. Um, Andrew Carfee is at um, Moderna. And uh, Dr. Gandhi on this call is involved in the clinical management working group. But uh, my group, which I co-lead with uh, Mark Namchuk, really is focused on three areas. Uh, the first really is to repurpose currently available drugs. And what I mean by this is sort of an approach that's typically used is whereby one can look at drugs that have been approved by the FDA, say, and are known to be safe and tolerant in humans and ask whether or not these drugs could be reused in this case uh, for their antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. And so um, we can get into this in the discussion. There's some challenges with repurposing from the standpoint that a lot of the assays are assays we do in the lab in tissue culture plates. For example, hydroxychloroquine um, having its antiviral uh, effect in a specific kind of uh, African green monkey cell line. Uh, but ultimately, um, a lot of those uh, types of approaches have not really gone through the rigorous testing that's required when we think about drug design in general, which is testing in animal models to demonstrate efficacy. Um, and then ultimately a longer term goal is identifying new drugs with activity against viral enzymes. Um, so for example, there's been a great deal of success targeting viral enzymes in he the human immunodeficiency virus um, and hepatitis C virus, as Dr. Walensky mentioned. But these are, tend to be longer efforts that take years um, to come to fruition. And then lastly, I should add the therapeutic antibodies bit, and this falls into the category of passive immunization. And really, this is something that's been tried for more than 100 years now, really pioneered by Emil von Behring and Kitasato Shiba Subaru against diphtheria and tetanus. Um, the idea was that individuals who've recovered from infection by a given pathogen have um, something in their blood or they are uh, part of their humoral immune system that can be transferred to individuals who are sick or at risk of being sick to prevent or treat infection in those individuals. And so both scientists did some pioneering work looking at the plasma's mechanism of action and defined it as um, antitoxins or neutralizing antibodies. And so SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has an envelope um, here shown in gray. In this envelope sits the viral spike protein. Um, this spike protein is responsible for attaching to cells and allowing the virus to productively infect cells it needs to infect during infection. Um, antibodies can bind the spike protein and prevent uh, it from interacting with receptors on host cells that are required for this infection step, as well as uh, through a specific arm they have, their FC portion, uh, recruit immune cells to help clear viral particles. And so, you know, these antibodies, for example, are molecules that we all have in our bloods produced by our immune system, and of course are attractive targets for vaccine design efforts, as a number of vaccines work by inducing antibodies that can protect individuals from infections like virus, uh, from viruses like influenza virus, for example. Um, I should add that uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2 now, there are multiple research programs uh, both in industry and in laboratories who are uh, working very hard to identify monoclonal antibodies to be used as therapy. And this is to replace um, the immune plasma approach I told you about in the pre previous slide. And so the 
Uh, immune plasma approach or convalescent plasma uh, is one, again, that it was even tried in 1918 uh, against influenza virus. Um, as uh, in 1918 and as in now, uh, data are really often conflicting. Um, as Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Walensky mentioned, uh, and the, the importance of controls, a lot of these studies are non-randomized, non-placebo controlled and anecdotal. Um, and they're difficult to design as well because uh, more of the plasma is limited in supply. Uh, there's a requirement for blood type matching. Uh, individuals have to also be screened for a number of bloodborne pathogens, including HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, uh, depending on what part of the world you are in, um, also against Chagas. And then uh, this is a critical bit here. Uh, the plasma ideally should be tested for activity before infusing it. Now, this gets to the issue of batch-to-batch -batch variability, meaning that if uh, one individual uh, survives COVID-19, they might have a very robust uh, activity for um, neutralizing antibodies in their plasma, but another person uh, might not. And we actually don't know why that is, but uh, in instances in which convalescent plasma has worked, um, I could talk about an example in discussion. A uh, critical aspect of that approach was really testing the plasma for activity before infusing it. And so, for example, there's an effort now at, through MassCPR led by Dr. Lindsay Bad, uh, Baden um, uh, at, uh, I think, the Brigham Women's Hospital and additional hospitals who are doing this sort of testing, working with a scientist at BIDMC uh, to test the plasma um, for activity uh, before infusing it into patients. But again, timing-wise, uh, the number of cases in the Boston area um, plummeted by the time this infrastructure was set up. And so again, these studies are very difficult to design, particularly when we add uh, the aspect of timing. And so monoclonal antibodies can be made in the lab, uh, isolate from the blood of COVID-19 convalescent donors. Um, they can be used as single drugs or in combinations as cocktails to prevent or treat infection. And these monoclonal antibodies are the same molecules I showed you in the previous slide floating around uh, that now one can make in the lab um, in reproducible quantities of reproducible activity. And some um, uh, places actively working on such strategies include companies like Eli Lilly, uh, Regeneron, um, as well as Veer, uh, who have now uh, drugs in the clinic, which is quite exciting which is interesting from a historical standpoint, meaning that we're in a day and an age now where the technology moves so fast that perhaps monoclonal antibodies uh, moving forward will replace even an attempt at using convalescent plasma since uh, uh, the scientific community was able to move quickly to generate these. And so I think when we think about new trials, you know, this uh, theme uh, is something that resulted in all of the presentations is, can we identify drugs that when used early enough could prevent worsening of infection at hospitalization or death? Uh, you know, what is the therapeutic window? Is there a finite time point at which one uh, has to intervene before uh, it is too late? And I mean, for example, if we compare to influenza virus, uh, the drug there also Tamivir or Tamiflu, it's very clear that it has to be used early on. Um, to have an effect really. Will this be the same case for SARS-CoV-2? And that has implications on how we think about all allocating drugs like antibodies and remdesivir. And then, uh, you know, probably a relationship between prevention, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, and early treatment of infection as opposed to late stages of infection, where the therapeutic approach might need to focus not solely on battling infection, but also perhaps on uh, fighting an over-exuberant immune response uh, with agents like steroids or um, drugs that uh, inactivate uh, uh, a number of cytokines that will be identified, for example, as critical to pathogenesis and inflammation. So it's quite complex, but I think uh, a theme I want to get across is that uh, time is of the essence, and there's probably a finite therapeutic window for a number of the approaches we're talking about, which is critical to sort out, and we'll only find this out by doing very careful, randomized, controlled clinical trials. And so that's all I had. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen now and pass it back. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. I think that is, all of these talks were just, um, I think they wove together so perfectly. And I think we have a lot of wonderful questions for you all. I might um, ask the first question as we pull up our students. You know, I was really struck by all three of your 
conversations, we're describing this inherent tension between the need for rigorous science that takes time, and obviously in this case, enough patients who um, are afflicted with COVID, and the immediacy of the need that patients have in front of you. And I know that, um, that some of you are, are navigating that real time. Um, and, and Dr. Walensky, you spoke to that inherent tension as the division chief trying to help allocate this. And then when you're thinking also about the, the, this moment of, of high level politicization of both messaging and also as, as you alluded to Dr. Walensky, um, distribution of medications. And so I wonder just in your individual roles, how you navigate this tension personally when you're thinking about it. And, and Dr. Gandhi also spoke about the HIV epidemic, which is maybe the last time as a nation we faced this um, inherent challenge. So I might just ask you individually how you navigate this while we pull in our first student question. I'm you. Maybe I'll pick up a point that Dr. Walensky made and, and just expand on it and even personalize it. Um, in April and May, um, there was great uncertainty about what did and didn't work, certainly in April before we had any real data. And we had these single arm studies of hydroxychloroquine, for example, and then we had single arm studies of a drug called tocilizumab, you know, which was a, a drug that blocks one of the cytokines, one of the inflammatory mediators. And I still remember calling Dr. Walensky late at night one <laughs> night saying there's a pregnant woman who has COVID-19 who um, is verging on the, end, uh, on the verge of needing to be on a ventilator. Should we give her tocilizumab? Who is authorized to make that decision? We don't know if it works. Um, who, who, should, who should do that? And it was very much during that chant time when we were having daily um, case discussions, uh, the COVID-19 here and now treatment uh, panel that Dr. Kim and, and I were involved with. And so it harkened me back though, because I agonized over that decision that day. We um, harkened me back to a thing that's fundamental to medicine, which is the do no harm um, um, process. We don't know, and we did not know then, and that night I did not know whether tocilizumab would help her. And we ultimately did not give her tocilizumab. Um, she got better, <laughs> um, and she left the hospital a couple of days later. Um, but um, it really, you know, checked my own emotions as to how do we handle these decisions. We ultimately set up a multidisciplinary team that involved infectious disease and pulmonary and rheumatology people because they work in, in this area. And, and we made those decisions until we got more data. But it, um, I want to make one point here about hydroxychloroquine. Observational data, you give a drug and someone gets better. Um, it's very prone to, over the history of medicine to errors, um, not just in infectious disease, actually in hormone replacement therapy, which was widely used in, in postmenopausal women in the 80s and 90s, we were convinced based on observational data that that would prevent heart attacks. And it turned out when they finally did a, a comparative trial that was randomized, it turned out not only to not prevent heart attacks, it actually promoted heart attacks. <laughs> and so throughout medicine, not just in infectious disease, we can be misled. And unless you, you, um, you know, ground yourself in some type of science, uh, you, you don't make progress. And, um, and you need to make progress in a pandemic and you need to make it quickly. That means that we need to do these trials quickly. I think we can do it, um, but we can't um, uh, do it without trials. And that's why I actually talked to Ben Linus around that time when they couldn't get um, access to drugs. And I said, the do no harm thing still prevails. We don't know if a drug works. We'll only know if it works if we, if we find out through a trial. And that's why I, could, I slept that night is because I realized I did not know if tocilizumab <laughs> would work. And, and therefore I, you know, we had to find out. So I don't know if that answered your question. But. Maybe I'll make three points in response. And um, I very much remember that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know if it was going to work. <laughs> um, uh, so three points. One is the people who are doing the clinical trial are so invested. It's been months of work. They're, they're deeply invested in it want, wanting to prove that it works. And we are deeply invested in trying to make sure we're doing the right thing for patients. It's very hard to see the 30,000 foot view um, when you're in it. It just is a, as, as noted, it's just really hard. The second point I wanna make is um, 
I want to actually layer on two other aspects that have made this really challenging. So it's one thing to say, we don't know about whether this is going to work or not. We'd like to enroll you in a clinical trial. It's another thing to, to just, you know, picture, picture a room. Everyone is in PPE. You're communicating. Um, you can't see anybody's face. You can't even see if somebody's smiling. Um, you're, there are no loved ones around. And there's a language barrier because about 60% of our patients who are admitted during our peak had a language barrier. Um, now have an informed consent conversation. And it just brings you to a place where you, you can't touch, you can't see, you can't speak in ways that are natural to you. And it makes it very hard to even think about having, you know, what you feel to be an appropriate conversation about how to best do this. We did a lot of phone calling. We did a lot of video conferencing. We spoke to family and loved ones, but that layer on was, was really even that much more complicated. And then one other comment with regard to Dr. Abraham's um, piece, which was great, is cost, right? So we have heard that um, when vaccines are distributed, it is likely that they will be distributed free of charge, at least in the first couple of waves. Um, monoclonal antibodies are among the most expensive drugs that we have. Um, in monoclonal antibody therapy, they can cost $100,000 to $150,000 a year. One-time monoclonal antibody doses are infusions. They are up to $1,000 a dose. Um, if this is going to be an outpatient therapy at $1,000 a dose for vulnerable communities, how are we going to bring that to people? Well, thank you. A very good points. I just wanted to add, um, in terms of the bit uh, of a question about the data. So uh, I remember actually doing this as a graduate student, just doing sort of a survey to try to understand for which viral infections by an emerging agent do we know that convalescent plasma actually works as a therapy. And I was surprised. I mean, it's been tried with Ebola virus. It's been tried with Lassa virus. It's been tried with most of the pathogens, perhaps, that back then were making news when there were outbreaks. But I was only able to find sort of one series of robust studies done in Argentina in the 1980s where they did just that, use placebo control, um, uh, a placebo control study to show that escalating doses of neutralizing antibodies were effective. And then 40 years thereafter, they were able to do retrospective analysis to show that it works quite well, but that you have to give it within the first eight days of illness, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, and also that um, ultimately there were some complications one had to worry about over time, but these were all sort of safety parameters that were gathered because of a well-conducted study. And then, so I asked our collaborator in Argentina, so why don't we have something safe for a related virus that circulates instead of Argentina and Bolivia? They said, well, they were never able to do the study um, people got ragbavarin, another drug, and things got mixed up. So they never were able to uh, effectively get their act together to organize the study because, again, it's so challenging to do. Uh, but, you know, without uh, rigorous data, what my fear would be is that we wouldn't have uh, in hand approaches that we perhaps could figure out work uh, for the next outbreak. So we need to get this information now to prepare better for the future. Yeah, those are all great points. I I was going to bring on, do you, Dr. Gandhi, do you want to say something before I bring on a student? No, I was going to just leave this one bit together with a comment that I see in the chat, which has to do with um, um, leadership. Um, and it kind of harkens again back to HIV. Um, we need a, a coordinated response to COVID-19, and we have not had a coordinated response to COVID-19. We need um, um, experts. We need people who have deep knowledge to, to guide the response. And I, th I think that's what um, a, a person was asking about the, the um, uh, treatment, how HIV advanced. It was really because um, there was a delay. Let's be honest. There was a long delay with HIV before there was a coordinated government response. Um, years went by before there was a coordinated government res response. But it was one there was a attention to this problem and a coordinated response that progress began to be made. And, um, I, and the need is greater even now because this is much faster moving than HIV ever was in terms of its transmission and, you know, um, more than 30 million people in six months infected. I mean, that, that's, that's the pace that it has to go on. But we, we need that response. And, and, um, and I think when you talk about HIV and COVID, um, you know, I would just say that's the, the fundamental to both. So. Yes. How can you solve the distribution problem if Dr. Walensky is having to send it, you know, 
herself um, or the hospital side of them to send it herself to other themselves to other places it's, it's got to you know this is when you need coordination and that's absolutely to that point that dr walensky and others had to make that decision instead of it being coordinated yeah. from the government so absolutely i'm going to bring on our first student here we have a bunch of questions <laughs> 